I think we can start. We have 76 participants on the line and more will join. So for me, this is a really great opportunity um, to launch our Women's Hemispheric Network virtually. Um, and as many of you know, um, the issue of women's uh, empowerment and engagement is one of my most um, interesting um, and most important uh, topics for me. I think there is nothing more important um, than engagement. And I actually see the opportunity for women to have more empowerment in this crisis because men are staying home too and they need uh, to share in the uh, many tasks of the home. So I see this as maybe one of these unique opportunities. So we are really lucky to have Siri uh, Chilasi. Did I say that right, Siri? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Talk about unconscious bias in the workplace and what it looks like and how to overcome it. Um, this evening, um, we are also organizing this in um, cooperation and coordination with our young professionals of the Americas, YPA, another part of my very favorite parts of the organization because the young people in the organization started it, organize it, and keep it going. So Siri is a recognized expert in advancing women and promoting gender equality um, within organizations. She specializes in translating academic research into practical approaches and tools to design a more inclusive workplace. Now, due to the uh, number of callers today, all of your lines will be muted. At, but at the end of her uh, comments, uh, we are going to open it up for questions and comments. You're gonna have to raise your hand um, digitally via WebEx um, or just send us a question via WebEx chat. And we will call on you and let you ask your own question unless you're too shy, in which case you can just give us the question. Uh, just remember to unmute um, your phone. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Siri who will share her insights aimed at young professionals, I don't know why I'm on the call, <laughs> to recognize unconscious, unconscious bias. She'll speak for about 20 to 25 minutes. And I only wanna finish with one comment. I was with a young mentee of mine um, who since left the organization and she was negotiating a, um, a position for herself. And she said, Am I going to sound too aggressive if I asked for this? And I said, and what male do you know that would have asked that question? Exactly. Um, she turned around and started to laugh and said, oh, I think you're right. <laughs> asked for everything and got it all. So with that, I'm going to pass. I love it. that. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and welcome everybody. I'm so uh, grateful and so appreciative that you're here, even though I can't see all of you. It's for the young and the young at heart. So that includes all of us. Uh, this is going to be the most stressful part of the whole day for me, which is I need to figure out how to work here on my screen, but I think we made it. Um, so like Susan said, I'll talk for about 20 to 25 minutes about unconscious bias in the workplace, what it is, what it looks like, and how we can overcome it. And then I'm very excited to hear all your questions, your comments, your challenges. So feel free to even write them down as we go along or drop them in the chat so that they're ready to go for the Q&A. I'd like to start today by introducing you to Heidi Roizen. Heidi is not a household name, but she's a very well-known venture capitalist, um, entrepreneur, and investor in Silicon Valley. And she's also the main character in a case study that um, a couple of my colleagues at Harvard Business School wrote several years ago. And we use this case study in business schools and in graduate schools around the world to teach students about successful entrepreneurship, successful investing, how to have a successful career in the tech sector. But sometimes when we teach this case study, we run a little experiment with it. We give it to our students in two groups so that half the students get the original case study with Heidi's name on it. And the other half of the students get the exact same case study, but with Heidi's name swapped out for Howard. 
students read this on their own. They answer some questions, take a little survey before they come into class, and then they come into class and debate the case study. And when we run this experiment with students, Heidi and Howard, here's what we tend to find. Uh huh. Let me see. There we go. So students actually rate Heidi and Howard as being equally competent, which is good news because they're the same person doing all the same things. But as you can see from the graph here on the slide, they don't see Heidi and Howard as being equally likable. In fact, the same behaviors coming from Heidi are rated as more power hungry, self promoting and disingenuous than those exact same behaviors when they're coming from Howard. So the fact of the matter is that we humans are not objective in the way we judge other people's behavior and things like gender come into it. This is something called the competence likability trade off. It's an example of unconscious bias that women primarily tend to experience in the workplace. And where it comes from is the fact that Heidi doesn't look the part, so to speak. She doesn't fit our expectations of who an investor or an entrepreneur is because the stereotype or the prototype, if you close your eyes and you think, okay, I hear entrepreneur, what's the first image that comes into your mind? It's probably a young white dude in a hoodie. Um, it's not Heidi Roizen. So she doesn't look the part of an investor stereotypically, but she also doesn't fit our expectations of what a traditional or typical or good woman is like because she's very aggressive, Susan, to your point earlier, very assertive. She cares a lot about money. She's out there pounding the table, making deals, uh, doing very well for herself. And those behaviors and qualities go against what we stereotypically think of as feminine behaviors because women in our culture, in our stereotypes, are supposed to be warm and caring and putting other people's interests above their own. Now, I'm not saying that's how it should be. I'm certainly not saying I agree with any of those stereotypes, but that is the socialization and the conditioning. That's the environment that we've all grown up in. Those are the messages that we've received from our environments about what entrepreneurs are like and supposed to be like and what women do and what they're like and what they're supposed to be like. And because Heidi doesn't fit the part, she doesn't fit our expectations, we punish her essentially by finding her less likable. And that's the competence likability trade off. So for women, it can be hard to be seen as both competent and likable at the same time. Whereas for men, where there's no conflict between masculine qualities and what a good man is like and what a good leader or business person is like, there's no conflict. So they can be seen as both competent and likable at the same time. I start with that story just as an example of one of the many ways in which unconscious bias manifests itself in life and in the workplace. I would encourage you all, if you have time at some point, to go take one of these free implicit association tests online. The link is on the screen. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes online to take one of these. And it's a great way to learn more about your own biases and see for yourself how those biases that are baked into your brains actually influence your decision making on a daily basis. So you can go do that after the call. But for now, let's do a quick exercise all together. I'm going to ask you to take a look at this checkerboard and just quickly determine which square is darker. The one one labeled A or the one labeled B. So you've made your decision. I'll ask you to keep looking at scores A and B as I just quickly cover up the rest of the board. And I wonder if by now you have a different view or if you've changed your answer. So let me go back to convince you that all I'm doing is truly just covering up the rest of the board. I'm not tricking you at all here. In fact, if anything, it's your own brain tricking itself. This here is another example of unconscious bias in action. Our brains are bombarded by about 11 million pieces of information every single second. So in order not to get completely overwhelmed and in order to make decisions within a reasonable amount of time, our brains have to resort to patterns and mental shortcuts to process all of this information and to make decisions. And that's exactly what happens here on the checkerboard. As soon as you saw the slide, you 
recognized a familiar pattern, the checkerboard, a light square next to a dark square. Um, your brain even took into account the uh, shadow cast by the green cylinder. And you pretty much unconsciously, unconsciously, pardon me, and pretty much instantaneously determined, at least most of you on the call probably did, like I did, that square A has to be darker than square B, which in this case turns out to be the wrong conclusion. So takeaway number one, all of us are biased. And bias is quite simply these mental patterns and shortcuts and heuristics that we use constantly from second to second, from minute to minute to process information and make decisions. But there's another much more important, I think, takeaway from this checkerboard, which is the following. How many of you right now looking at this still see square A as being darker than B? even though I already proved to you that they're actually the same color. I can tell you, I still see A as darker than B, and I've seen this animation about 5,000 times. So our brains are incredibly stubborn beasts, and it turns out that just being aware of the fact that you're biased or just having that knowledge that bias does exist and influence our decision making is often not enough to overcome its effects. We need some additional help, which in this case is the change in the environment. It's the white blinders that I'm bringing in that help to cover up the rest of the board. They quite literally take away the pattern so that your brain no longer resorts to that checkerboard pattern as a mental shortcut, but it's able to see A and B for what they really are and do justice to A and B and see that they're the same color. This is a really important idea that we'll return to in just a moment. This idea that our brains can't do it with knowledge alone. We often need some help in the environment. Because here is what most companies are doing today to deal with unconscious bias. It's things like diversity training, negotiation training, leadership training, a lot of trainings as you can see, networking events, mentorship and sponsorship. These are all great except that there's no research evidence to suggest that any of these actually work to bring about more diversity and inclusion in our organizations. There's also no evidence to suggest that any of these um, interventions or solutions actually help to de-bias human brains at all. In fact, all of the evidence we, we have today suggests that it's almost impossible to take unconscious bias out of our individual brains. It's simply baked into how our brains work. And yet companies in the US spend about eight to $10 billion a year on all these different types of diversity initiatives. It would be money well spent if, if it worked, but sadly there's no evidence that it does. So if all of this does not work to help de-bias our workplaces and help provide a level playing field for women and men to thrive in advance, what then does work instead? This is where I have some good news for you. And I want to share the story of how orchestras, symphony orchestras in the United States, were able to diversify their ranks dramatically. They started being about 5% female in the early 1970s. And today, about 40% of musicians in symphony orchestras are female. That's an incredible transformation in about 40 or 50 years. And some of you may know that one of the changes the orchestras made in this time is they started auditioning new incoming musicians behind a curtain so that the orchestra directors could hear the music that was being played in the audition, but they couldn't see who was playing. And when my colleagues studied this later on, they discovered that just that small process change of putting in a curtain in the audition process helped to advance, uh, increase a female musician's chances of advancing to the next round in the audition by 50%. Notice that the orchestras didn't put their orchestra directors through diversity training or unconscious bias training. They didn't give the directors information about how unconscious bias influences decision making. They just said, let's change the environment or the process a little bit so that your inherently biased brains can make better decisions. And this is an example of a concept that I want to introduce to you and that I hope you'll take away from today. And that concept is called behavioral design. 
Behavioral design builds on decades of research from fields like psychology, neuroscience, economics, um, social psychology about how we humans actually behave and how our brains work in reality, not in fancy theories, but in actuality. And once we know how we humans actually behave, then that enables us to design systems and processes and environments that help our brains nonetheless make better decisions. That's the essence of behavioral design. Here's another example that might resonate with many of you who frequently travel and stay in hotels. You might have stayed at a hotel where when you walk in the room, there's this little contraption by the door and you have to put your key card in to turn all the lights and the electricity on in the room. And then when you exit your room, you take your key card with you, all the lights automatically turn off. This is another example of behavioral design. If you were the hotel manager and your goal was to get people to conserve more energy, you could put up signs everywhere that say, please, please, please remember to turn the lights off. Or you could even offer to give people more loyalty points upon check-in if they take a pledge that says, I promise I will turn the lights off every time I leave the room. But it turns out that this small change in the environment, this little contraption in every guest room, is by far the most effective way to change people's behavior and to get them to actually turn the lights off when they're not in the room. That's the power of behavioral design, is by making small changes into the context within which we make decisions. Even though our minds remain as biased as they ever were, we can nonetheless help to debias the decisions or the behaviors that arise as a result. So what I want to impress upon you is bias exists everywhere. It's baked into both human brains and into the environments that we live in. But while human brains are really difficult to debias, the systems and the environments around us are actually much easier to debias. And I want to bring this back into the workplace context and give you some specific examples of what that could look like at the individual level in your own work and in your um, sort of among your colleagues, among your teams in your companies. My first suggestion is about fundamentally how we make decisions. These could be hiring decisions, promotion decisions, compensation decisions, uh, decisions about how to put people on a team, who to put on a team, or really any other decision. Because it turns out that our brains are naturally comparative. So let's say you're drinking coffee today. How good that coffee tastes implicitly is a comparison to the coffee that you're used to drinking. It's not how good is this coffee in vacuum. It's how good is this coffee relative to the coffee that I've had before or that I'm used to having. And it's exactly the same when we evaluate people. It turns out that when we look at just one person in isolation, whether we're, let's say, evaluating them for a hire or a promotion, we are much more likely to resort to our unconscious biases and to be guided by our stereotypes than when we have multiple candidates in front of us that we are able to compare and calibrate against each other. So we generate less biased decisions and we generate more diversity in our decision making when we have more options in front of us. So if you were going to give feedback to a team member, instead of giving feedback to one person today and another team member two weeks from now and yet another team member or colleague a month from now, it would actually be better to try to give feedback to all three of those people in the same day. Because that way your brain is better able to calibrate those people against each other and you're likely to give more accurate, more objective and less biased feedback. The same concept would apply to hiring is instead of having one open position and filling it now and filling another open position in June and another one in October, it would be better to run all three of those recruitment processes at the same time in parallel and then pick three people to hire at the same time for those three open positions. Let me move on to self-evaluations. It's often hard to apply that principle of anonymization, that the curtain from the orchestra auditions where we blind ourselves to what's going on. Sometimes you can do that in hiring by taking people's names and some other demographic information off of resumes to 
not be guided by your stereotypes or biases when you're evaluating their resumes. But um, it's often not possible in the workplace because we know who everyone is. We're dealing with each other face to face. One place, though, where we can blind ourselves is the self-evaluation process. Many of you might work in companies where you are first asked to fill out a self-evaluation and then that self-evaluation gets sent to your manager. They review it and then they make or write up their own evaluation of you and that becomes your performance evaluation. The reason why we're concerned about this as academics who specialize in bias is because one of the cognitive biases, the unconscious biases that we all share is called anchoring. And what anchoring does to our brains is when we see a number, that number immediately becomes a reference point from which we adjust up or down. We're no longer able to make a completely independent assessment. So we were hypothesizing that when a manager sees their employee's self-evaluation, that self-evaluation probably becomes an anchor from which they adjust up or down instead of coming up with their own objective judgment of that employee's behavior. So a couple of my colleagues studied a large multinational company and this is exactly what they found. So I'm going to show you some data here on employee self ratings first. And we had a year when the employees um, filled out their self rating and it went to their manager. And then we had a special year where due to a computer glitch, the employees still filled out their self evaluations, but managers actually never saw those evaluations before assigning their own grades. So what we see here is that when employees filled out their self ratings, men tended to rate themselves significantly higher than women. So men are the blue bar, women are the pink bar, and the line zero in the middle is the average. So you see that men were rating themselves higher than average and women were rating themselves lower than average in the self evaluations. This trend was exactly the same in both years when the managers saw the evaluations later on and when they didn't because the employees at the time when they were filling their self-evaluations had no idea whether they were going to be seen by managers or not. And by the way, this is something that we consistently see in other research as well, is men in general tend to rate themselves more highly in various contexts. So now let me show you the manager evaluations, same scale. When managers did see the employee self-evaluations, they still rated men higher than women, so the blue bar is higher than the pink bar, but notice that they pulled everyone closer to the center. So they pulled the women, pulled the guys down from their very high self-esteem, and they also lifted the women up. So they closed the gender gap in evaluations, but not completely. There's still a gap that remains with men's evaluations being higher than women's. Here's the real kicker. This is how managers evaluated their employees when they did not see their self-evaluations in advance. They, in fact, rated women significantly higher than men when they were not influenced by the men's higher self-ratings. So what we see here is that seeing an employee's self-evaluation substantially influences your judgment and it substantially disadvantages women in the performance evaluation process. So what can we do about this? If you are in an organization where you have the power to actually shape the evaluation process, I would either encourage you to get rid of self-evaluations completely or at least make sure that they are not shared with managers before those managers come up with their own ratings. If you're an employee and you're asked to share, to conduct a self-evaluation and then share it with your manager, I actually found myself in this position a couple of years ago. I went up to my manager and I said, listen, research shows that this can have a biasing effect, completely unconscious, unintentional. We all fall prey to the same biases. But nonetheless, that me showing you my self-evaluation can have a biasing effect. Would you be open to filling out your evaluation independently first? I'll do the same. And then we'll meet and we'll swap evaluations and we can have a conversation. That's what I would recommend. I was looking that my manager was very receptive to that type of um, approach um, and it actually resulted in a really great conversation. But this is a big bias trap to watch out for in organizations.
I have a couple more quick things to share with you. The next story is about the power of data and the importance of collecting data to reveal bias. Um, this picture here refers to the 5050 project at the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, where a gentleman named Roz Atkins, he's here in this picture on your left. He's a news anchor. He has a nightly primetime news show. And a couple of years ago, he started having the suspicion that women and men weren't equally represented in the BBC content. So he started counting the number of women and men appearing on his own one hour long show. And he found that in fact, over the course of a month, only 39% of the people appearing on screen were women. So there was a significant gender gap, which by the way, nobody really knew until they started counting. And so that realization and his own efforts on his show to get to 50-50, so that in an hour of television, half of the people appearing on screen would be women and half men, or um, in the BBC's online content, if there's an article, 50% of the people named in that article should be women and 50% men. Um, those efforts have now morphed into this global 50-50 project that has thousands of people across the BBC participating, and also more than 50 partner organizations around the world. Other media organizations and corporations and education uh, institutions of higher education. I share the story with you because data doesn't have to be big and scary and complicated and difficult. It can be as simple as looking around and saying, how many women and men do we have on my work team? Or if you're part of a network that um, organizes events and invites speakers, um, look back over the last year or two, how many of the people, the speakers you invited were women versus men? Um, how many of them were women of color uh, versus white women, right? It can be a matter of simply starting to count and track and monitor these types of um, quite straightforward and simple metrics that can help to expose instances of bias and in places where unconsciously you might have a gender gap. And that's been a phenomenally powerful strategy for the BBC. Um, and the power of data to drive change and be an engine for change uh, is something that we're seeing increasingly in organizations that are taking a more data-driven and metrics-driven driven approach to diversity and inclusion. Anyone can start counting, anyone can start collecting data. You do not have to be a senior executive and you do not have to be an HR to raise these questions and come armed with data to start share, um, showing light at places in the company where changes might need to be made. Let's move on to talking quickly about language. Here's an example of a job advertisement for a kindergarten teacher. And they're looking for a warm and caring teacher with um, excellent pedagogical skills to work in a collaborative environment. If you look closely, you'll see that I've bolded and italicized some of the words. And if you look at those words and see what's common to them, it turns out they are words that in our culture are implicitly gendered. There's obvious gendered words like women, men, ladies, gentlemen, girls, and boys. But there's also words like collaborative, warm, and caring that are not gendered on the surface, but actually are strongly associated with femininity in our culture versus masculinity. On the flip side, if I had a job advertisement for a software engineer, let's say, that was looking for an aggressive, individualistic coding ninja, well, that would be a very masculine, um, masculinely worded job description right there. The reason this matters is because studies have shown that language like this unconsciously influences our behavior. For a job advertisement like this one for kindergarten teachers, we're going to see a disproportionate amount of applications from female applicants. We are unconsciously and unwillingly turning off male applicants. And on the flip side for that individualistic coding ninja uh, software engineering job description, we would see a disproportionate number of men applying for that job. So sometimes without even consciously trying, we are narrowing the talent pool that we're pulling from. We are turning some people off. 
The good news is that something like this is very easy to fix. Here's a suggested reword for this particular job description, and we could simply just say we're looking for an excellent teacher with exceptional pedagogical skills. One way to get rid of gendered language is just to replace gendered words with neutral words. Another option is to balance the gendered words that you're using to make sure that you have some masculine and some feminine in there so that you're appealing to the broadest possible audience. Now, many of you might not write job descriptions in your daily work. I realize that. But gendered language shows up everywhere we use language. It shows up in performance evaluations. It shows up in letters of recommendation. It shows up in blurbs that we put on the company website where we uh, are talking about people's work or highlighting projects that certain people are working on. Do we call women um, hardworking and motivated? And do we call the men in intelligent and capable, right? There's a subtle difference there in tone of how we describe people. Um, similarly, in spoken language, of course, you know, we're having a promotion conversation and we say someone's a go-getter and that might be a man. And then when we talk about the woman, we say, oh, she's a little too intense, even though maybe they've been displaying exactly the same behavior. Gendered language is an easy thing to fix once you know what you're looking for. And there are, in fact, online um, both free websites where you can copy and paste in a piece of text and it'll flag any gendered language for you. And there's also software um, that you would have to pay for that will do the same thing for you. Flag any gendered words and even suggest gender neutral alternatives. All right, I don't want to talk for too much longer. So this is the last idea or intervention that I want to share with you. And this is about culture and about social norms. Looking at these two beaches, which one would you feel more comfortable dropping a piece of trash on? The left beach or the right beach? My guess is that's an easy, easy decision, easy question, and easy answer for most of you. But I think the more interesting question is why do we almost universally feel more comfortable littering on the left beach than we would on the right beach? And this is where it comes down to social norms. Social norms are the um, shared understandings, but often unspoken understandings of what types of behavior is expected and what types of behaviors are accepted. On the left beach, it's very clear that it's acceptable to throw trash around. No one's going to call you out for it, and you're not going to feel bad doing it because everyone else is doing it too. On the right beach, on the other hand, the social norms are completely different. It's very clear that littering is not something other people do there. And if you did drop a piece of trash, there's a reasonable chance that someone might actually come up to you and say, hey, that's not okay. Stop trashing. That's not what we do here. And none of us want to be called out for bad behavior because we want to be seen doing the right things. So this is the tremendous power that social norms have to shape our behavior. So if we bring this back to the workplace, think about meetings in your organization. Is that more of a dirty beach or a clean beach environment? What I mean by that is if someone interrupts another person, what happens? Or if someone makes um, an uncomfortable joke, a racist, a sexist statement, what happens? Do they get called out? Does everyone chuckle nervously? Does everyone kind of look down in their lap, but no one does anything? Um, how about um, social events? Is everyone invited? Or are there some people that are left off of invitation? And then when that's discovered, what happens? There's a wonderful term called the micro sponsorship. And micro sponsorship refers to the small acts of support and affirmation that we provide to colleagues on a daily basis. Being a micro sponsor doesn't take any training, it doesn't take any special skills. And my guess is all of you are already doing it. But it's things like when someone gets interrupted in that meeting, you actually jumping in and saying, oh, wait a second, I'd love to hear Susan finish her point, please. Or if Susan had a great idea that she expressed five minutes ago, and now John is restating the exact same idea, and somehow everyone seems to think it's John's idea, as a micro-sponsor, I can chime in right there in that meeting and say, Yes, John, thank you. I'm really glad you're building on Susan's excellent point from five minutes ago. <laughs> These are small daily actions that help point out where bias is occurring and help collectively bring the group back on track. 
Because my guess is most people wouldn't say, oh, yes, we want to have a culture of meetings where people don't get proper credit for their ideas and where interruptions are rampant. Most people actually want to run inclusive meetings where everyone's voices are heard, people get an even chance to contribute, and where we attribute um, ideas properly to the right person. But we all play a big role and we all have a responsibility in creating and upholding those types of inclusive norms. All right, here's a quick summary of everything that we talked about. Uh, I offered some suggestions around making decisions jointly and simultaneously at the same time to reduce the amount of bias in decision making. We talked about not sharing self-evaluations with managers in advance if possible, using data to uncover biases to figure out where bias might be occurring, and then using that data to help us redesign those processes. We talked about being aware and careful of gender and language. And finally, about being a micro sponsor to create the type of inclusive culture that we ourselves want to live in. I want to leave you with a couple of resources in case you're interested in diving deeper. The first is the Gender Action Portal, which uh, my office, the Women in Public Policy Program at Harvard Kennedy School maintains. This is a free online database of academic research related to um, advancing gender equality across society. And we have summaries of academic studies that are specifically written for practitioners. Uh, they're short, they're pithy, and they give you the take ways in a very efficient manner. And I also want to share with you a couple of book recommendations pertaining to these subjects that we've been talking about. The first is What Works Gender Equality by Design by my colleague Iris Bennett. This book is specifically about how to bring behavioral, how to use behavioral design to de-bias um, the workplace and how to bring about more gender equality. The second book, Nudge, um, is about behavioral design more generally and how it can be applied as a concept to de-bias all types of settings. And then the last book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is for those of you who are really interested in psychology. Um, this talks about how our brains work and where biases come from. So with that, um, here's my email in case any of you would like to follow up. I'm always happy to chat more. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I really look forward to hearing your questions and your comments. Siri, first of all, thank you so much. I think we all benefited, no matter what the age, from uh, <laughs> that um, presentation. And I'd now like to open it up um, for uh, questions. Um, let me see who the first question's from. Uh, right, okay. So, What's my lineup of questions here, anybody? So I see one, Susan, I can chime in because I'm looking at the chat and there's one question here from Mayula. Yes, um, are mental shortcuts influenced by culture? Working in Latin America, unconscious bias I encountered was much macho Latino based. Thank you for that question. Yes. Uh, and biases are and mental shortcuts are to some degree culture based. Some of them are just universal and we see humans from all cultures across the world exhibiting exactly the same types of mental shortcuts and decision making biases. But there are others, um, stuff like machismo, things that are related to gender that definitely are influenced by the culture that we happen to grow up in. And if you grew up in a different type of culture, you develop different mental models and shortcuts and expectations, for example, of women's and men's roles. Okay, the next question is from Gracia Bolnes. Um, and do you wanna ask the question, Gracia? Hi, Siri, thanks a lot. Um, okay. um, the thing is, uh, uh, I worked in a company that we make like a lot of these uh, workshops for unconscious bias in the workplace. Yeah. And the problem for us is when we have men in this workshop and they are always like feeling threat instead of feeling engaged with the subject and they yeah. always said like i don't have any of these unconscious biases yeah gracias thank you that's a great question um the fact of the matter is um and this is why i love the checkerboard example of bias is it has nothing to do with gender it has nothing to do with race or anything else checkerboards are you know very kind of uh, neutral um object a neutral thing and 
all of us fall prey to the to our biases when we're looking at that checkerboard. So I think finding some examples or exercises that have nothing to do with gender bias first to show people that they are indeed biased because we all are. We're all in the same mode. It's not about assigning blame. It's not about saying, oh, good people are not biased and bad people are biased. All of us are in the same boat. Um, and the best solutions to dealing with the effects of bias are also not about trying to tackle individuals and about you know changing our hearts and our brains. The best solutions actually deal with changing the environment. And that's work that we can and should all undertake together. That's the message that I found to be helpful in breaking through some of that resistance a little bit that you were describing. Thanks a lot, that works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have another question on, it's not coming up on my screen. Yes, we have a question for from Anna J. Okay. Anna J, I don't know if you wanna ask the question yourself. Hi, thank you so much for this presentation and all this valuable information. Um, it's, it's really useful to me um, because I'm currently facing a situation where I have to deal with a male dominated um, area. And uh, in addition to the gender discrimination, I have to deal with age because I'm younger mm -hmm. and more experienced than my colleagues. Um, like in, er not I mean, I'm, I'm an attorney and I have, uh, well, I'm more experienced in, in a specific field, that's why they, they hired me. Yeah. And yeah. in addition, like the cultural ch uh, challenges. So it's it's really tough to me uh, how to face a 50 year old guy and uh, a 60 year old guy. And like, they, well, all women in this firm say like, this is like the club of Toby. Cause uh, well, th there's no really uh, gender equality at all. Yeah, yeah. And with these other things like uh, the credentials, age, and the national origin, it's, it's a mess. I, <laughs> yes, so, yes. Uh, I don't know how, what would be your suggestion on how to, to strengthen a little bit myself? I mean, I do the best I can with, with my performance, but there are always these external factors like the colleague who, who's trying to save his job. So then he he goes and makes gossip around and and there's nothing in connection really with work right, because they right. don't really know what they are doing professionally in this field. So that's why I'm there. But they cannot accept that if they don't know the the topic, well, they should just follow the advice based yeah, on other yeah. experience. Well, that's what I think, but I I'd, I'd like to have your suggestions. Yeah. yeah, Anna, thank you for that question. There's an in you, your question brings up a really interesting tension, which is there's the level of the individual and there's the level of the organization. I would never want to tell a woman in the workplace to solve this problem of gender inequality by behaving like a man and say, oh, just do what all the guys are doing because they seem to be getting ahead. And so that's how we'll solve this problem. Number one, it won't actually work because the Heidi Howard example that I shared in the beginning shows that even if women behave exactly the same way as men, they do all the same things. It's not perceived um, the same way by other people. But secondly, it's not real equality if women have to make themselves into men to get ahead. What we need is organizations that value employees and workers for who they are, which means that there's not just one narrow template of success, right? but you can have women and men of all colors and shapes and sizes doing things slightly differently and yet doing very well and succeeding and advancing. And that's the real work that needs to happen is, you know, 
things like performance evaluation kind of criteria, right? They've often been written so as to advantage men. And so one of the ways to level the playing field is to revisit those criteria and say, wait a second, you know, do we really need people to have charisma or executive presence? Those are very gender terms that favor men. But at the same time, I realize that that's not helpful advice to all of you on the call who are navigating a very biased workplace today and who are saying, well, that's great that organizations need to change, but I can't wait 50 years because my career is happening right now, so what can I do? So I, I'm very, very sort of sympathetic to that tension and I really hear it. But I don't want you to walk away from this thinking that this is your problem to solve, or that you need to somehow behave differently um, to fit to make contort yourself to fit the mold that has been set. I want women to succeed being their own fabulous selves and doing what they do. And it should be a collective effort in organizations to level the playing field and de -bias kind of the environment and the processes. I hope that makes sense. Thank you so much. That's a great Thank answer. You. There are so many questions that I'm gonna to try to combine a few yes. so we can get more in. So there's one question here from Bibi. Uh, which basically says what happens, um, you know, if when you have a woman manager and they may have actually a wider bias against other women that are their direct reports. Yeah, and yeah. the mirror image of that question is what happens if you have a male supervisor who really does discriminates against women and does not hide it? Mm. So those are two different questions, but they're interesting. I'll, I'll tackle both. So what we see in studies consistently is that women and men share exactly the same unconscious gender biases, because after all, we've grown up in the same culture, surrounded by the same movies and books and TV shows and teachers and all of that stuff. Um, so women are in no way less biased against other women, sadly. But what we do also see is that because we expect, as women, we expect other women to be more sympathetic to us, right? We think, oh, she's a woman. She's experienced all this harassment and discrimination. She should get it. Um, then when they behave in biased ways against us, we get more angry. And we actually counted more against them. I'll give you a quick personal example. I worked in a consulting firm years ago where almost all the partners were men, but there was one female partner. When the male partners ignored my emails, I thought to myself, well, of course, I'm a junior analyst. They're very busy and important. Of course, they would ignore my emails. However, when the female partner ignored my email, I sat there thinking, this is so unfair. She's a senior woman. She should care about advancing more junior women in this organization. She should want to talk to me, right? That was actually bias on my part because I interpreted her actions differently than I did her male peers because I expected her to be more kind of willing to help me. So it's coming from both sides. Yes, female managers have bias, but also sometimes we as the employees who report up to those managers also have disproportionate bias against them. Now, the second part of the question was about male managers who are openly discriminating against female employees. Um, that's a time when you want to start collecting evidence, writing down every instance of discrimination that you experience or you witness, even if it's not targeted at you. Um, you want to keep some of that evidence not on your work laptop or your work IT, but in a separate place where if you lose your job or you leave your job, you'll, you'll keep all the data with you. Um, potentially raise it to HR. HR, or even if it is a really serious situation, consider speaking to a lawyer for advice and potentially raising a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission um, because discrimination in the workplace is not okay. So we have a question um, from Todd Butt who would like to ask his own question. Todd. Great. You've got to unmute your line. Todd? All right, so we're going to move on. Kelsey Flitter, can you unmute your line and ask a question? 
Um, hi, Siri. Thank you so much for uh, your insight. I found the topic to be really interesting as we're all kind of women just navigating this space. Um, and the question that I wanted to ask is more in regard to, so in my personal experience, um, I've worked... <laughs> I've worked in a um, female dominated industry. And so um, I haven't necessarily encountered the types of biases that you mentioned in regard to having uh, male bosses or things like that. And so I wanted to know how should we as women sort of um, navigate those spaces when we have both women that we are reporting to and that women that are reporting to us so that we can be sort of the best um, partners to both fellow women and other uh, people in the workplace. That's a great question. Thank you, Kelly. I would say, um, I would bring this back to this concept of micro sponsorship, and I'll give you a couple of additional examples besides just meeting based examples of what that can look like. We all, regardless of how junior or senior we are in our careers, even if you just started out of college, you're at the entry level, you are in a position to be a mentor and a supporter for other people. Um, if you get invited to a meeting and you think someone else who wasn't on the invite would also benefit from being there, ask the organizer if you could bring someone along. Or if you're going to an industry conference, um, might it be possible for you to bring a more junior colleague along? Or if you're asked to do a speaking engagement or asked to do a project or asked to join a nonprofit board, really whatever it is that you're asked to do and you don't want to do it or you're not able to do it, instead of just saying no, could you make it a point for yourself to say, no, I can't do it but let me recommend these three other women that I know who are fabulous and who would be a great fit for this position. So on a daily basis, we have opportunities, all of us, to spread the love in a way, to spread opportunities, to give chances to shine to other people, to give them advice, to give them knowledge, um, to give them a chance to show what they're made of. And the more broadly we can distribute those types of opportunities, the faster we lift everybody up. Tosh, do you have, you have a question? Are you back, Tosh? If not, I can read it, Susan. Um, yeah, he asked, what can be done to generate more male allies given men are on the majority of senior leaders and making the hiring decisions? And should companies still quotas versus aspirational goals? Mm, okay, I'll tackle the second one first. Both quotas and goals work. There's a tremendous amount of evidence showing that they are both very effective strategies at increasing the representation of women or other underrepresented groups. The difference is that goals, uh, pardon me, quotas tend to generate a little bit more backlash because they are mandatory in nature, whereas goals are more voluntary. So in a culture and in a country like the US and in most corporate context, I would recommend based on the research evidence to go with as for, you know, difficult, challenging, aspirational goals um, instead of quotas that are mandatory. Now, in terms of generating more male allyship, I would really put this to the men. <laughs> it is their job to step up and, and be allies. Women are doing enough in the workplace already. Um, but of course, we have what we women can do um, is bring men into the conversation. If you're going to an event or attending a webinar like this, in addition to just you coming, um, bring a man along. You know, invite your boss or a male colleague and say, hey, I'm going to this webinar. I think this would be interesting. I'd love for you to come to. Or I'm going to this event. Would you like to come with me? And we can grab, you know, a meal afterwards or something. Um, if you have uh, if you have a women's network in your company uh, and you organize events, I would recommend making many, if not all of those events, gender neutral. I would recommend approaching senior leaders in the organization and inviting them to become the sponsors or the champions for your women's network. Or even if you don't have a network, but you just want to bring in a speaker or organize a, a one-off event, personally invite some of those male senior leaders so that they feel welcomed into the conversation. And then hopefully they'll come, hopefully they'll listen and learn something and be inspired to actually be more of an effective ally going forward. Next question. Yes, from Natalia Martins. Natalia, I can read your question. Uh, so how do you suggest dealing with that direct male boss who is clearly biased against women and is not ashamed of verbalizing his ideas? Yeah, I think Siri already touched on this one, actually. I think Susan actually read it out loud. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, Thank you. Yes, no, of course. So the next question was from Kathleen Holtzman. 
often I find that in a meeting, even mm -hmm. when women are represented, the men get much more airtime. Do you know examples of using data to measure and expose that? Mm, that's an excellent question. I love this one. Um, yes, the research would back up your experience. Um, one thing you could do is start um, counting how many times, just as you're sitting there in that meeting with your notebook in front of you, count the number of times a man spoke versus a woman and do that for a week or two and then raise it in the next meeting or raise it one-on-one -on -one with the person, the kind of leader of the meeting and say, here's something that I've noticed and I actually collected some data. Here's the data to prove that this is actually happening. Uh, I think this is something that we should tackle collectively. And if it's an environment that's very averse to gender, maybe you frame it in terms, not in terms of, oh, we want to make sure that women and men have a chance to contribute evenly. Maybe you say, we want to make sure that everyone in the meeting has a chance to contribute equally. And we want to going forward foster a culture of more participation in our meetings so that you don't make it overtly about gender, even though that was how you discovered the issue in the first place. Thanks. I guess I'm not on mute anymore. Thanks a lot. Of course. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I have one more question that someone um, asked, which I think is great. Is there more bias against women as they get more senior in an organization, in your opinion? So um, the answer is yes and no. It's not very easy to quantify bias, as in what's more and what's less. Uh, so that's the hard part of the question to answer. But what we do see is that um, at the more senior levels in organizations, bias has a bigger impact on how people advance in their careers. The reason for that is at the more junior levels, it is actually more about your performance. You, if you just put your head down and do the work, um, you know, often there are standardized timeframes for how quickly you advance to the next level and things like that. Um, so you can really get ahead purely based on performance, as you should, by the way. In most organizations, somewhere around the mid-level, there's a bit of an inflection point where after that, your advancement is actually more about the relationships you have. Who knows you? Who is advocating for you when you're not in the room? What's your reputation? Do people feel like they can trust you? If there's an opportunity for a stretch assignment or a new big project, do people have the confidence to put you on that project? Um, and because those relationship-based metrics are much more subjective and much more prone to bias and susceptible to bias, that's why at the more senior levels of people's careers, they often feel like bias is playing a bigger role in determining how and where they advance. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? I, I think it does, <laughs> but I'm not the person who asked it. So, but Siri, so the time has come that we have to end. Um, I want to thank you very much. The presentation was incredibly insightful. And you can tell from all the comments that were made uh, in our chat room that everyone was totally engaged. We had over thank 100 you. participants at the height. Um, so I want to really thank you. I want to invite you back. Hopefully, you'll join us in an in person. I would love that. Um, and I don't know if the chat room will remain open, but I'm happy to stay and, and answer some of those questions via chat. And also, you all have my email. It's siri.shalazi at gmail.com. So if I didn't get to your question, please feel free to email me. I'd be delighted to correspond afterwards, too. Thank you so much for coming. Siri, and be safe. And everybody on the, um, on the WebEx, please, I hope that you and your families are safe. Um, and are um, and stay safe. That's the only thing I can say. Um, thank you so yes, yes. much. Um, and I look forward to engaging with all of you again. This is one of the most important topics. I think, you know, women and bias and gender equality is mm -hmm. one of the most important issues. And it will be the generation of the young people that will finally reach uh, gender equality. So many of you from the Young Professionals Network that are on um, on the WebEx today, you should feel empowered and feel that you really have the opportunity to take the numbers in terms of senior management, in terms of board positions from where we are today to complete and total gender parity. And it really does make a difference because 
I'm on the board of Scotiabank and we have 40% women on the board. And that really does make a difference when you have that many women and you have real equality. So thank you very much for joining us today, Siri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks. Thanks.